But anyhow, if you come with me to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Got it? I'm still looking for a couple others, so bear with me. And uh, we've already covered a couple of them. But 1 Corinthians 15, 51, there's the word. Behold, I show you a mystery. Now that's a singular one. <clears throat> and what's he going to talk about? What we call the rapture. I show you a mystery, something that's never been revealed in Scripture before, and that is that we, he's speaking of himself as well as ourselves as believers today, there's going to be one group of believers at some point in time that will not die physically. It just has to be. If Christ is going to intervene and or yeah, intervene in human history and take the believers out and resurrect the dead, then it follows there has to be one group of people who will be living when that day comes. And he's not going to kill everybody so he can resurrect them. <laughs> so what does he do? He changes us if it should happen today. And I know it's hard. I, I can sometimes lay awake at night and I think, well, I can see why the unbelieving world thinks we're nuts. <laughs> Can't you? That all of a sudden, all of us, no matter where we are, will just be gone. I never thought of it before. And then Jim brought up the ex uh, where we're staying last night. What's going to happen to our clothes and shoes? <laughs> Gosh, I never thought of that. <laughs> and so some of these things, the unbelieving world just thinks that we are a bunch of kooks to think that there's coming a time when all of a sudden we're going to be taken out. But you see... I always come back to the words of the Lord Jesus himself, and I'll bet you know what I'm going to tell you. With God, nothing is impossible or all things are possible. Never forget that. Nothing. Nothing. The most extreme, bizarre thing that you can think of, with God, it's nothing. And so for him to call out the living believers at some point in time, that's as easy as falling off a log. And then to resurrect the dead from wherever they were throughout the church age. Now, I feel this is just for the body of Christ. All right? But it's been a secret. You cannot find language like this anywhere else in your Bible but Paul. Nowhere. Now, they had the idea of resurrection, but they had no idea of a group of living people who would be suddenly translated. All right? So it's called a mystery. All right, come back with me now a little further, and then I want to hit the answer to another question was uh, when I speak of faith plus nothing. Where do we get it? Where are the scriptures? All right, well, we're going to be coming to that in just a little bit. But, uh, oh, my goodness, it's wild since I've done this, so bear with me. And uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 3. Here's another time he uses the word. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 3. Going on from the verse we've already looked at. Now to verse 3. This dispensation of the grace of God, and within those frame marks of the dispensation of is this body of truth that Paul calls the mystery. Verse 3, how that by revelation, a revealing, an unveiling of things that had never been even spoken or whispered before, how by revelation he made known unto me. See, there's that singular pronoun over and over by Holy Spirit inspiration. How he made known unto me the mystery, the secret. As I wrote before in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, maybe this is a good time. Keep your hand in Ephesians and come back a minute to Second Peter. 
chapter 3, because once in a while, and, and I don't blame you, I don't blame you a bit if you say, well, now, Les, are you sure that old Paul is always on the right track? Well, then, here a few years ago, I found these verses, and any time somebody questions my approach to Paul, here's my answer. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And again, going by Coverdale. Who's writing? The Apostle Peter. Who's he writing to? Fellow Jews. What's the circumstance? They think the tribulation is just out in front of them. And if they can go through that, the king will be coming and they'll have the kingdom. All right. But now Peter has come to the end of his life. Things haven't happened like he thought. And he can already sense the executioner's whatever. And he knows that now he's going to have to leave his Jewish believers behind. But for the other non-believing Jews, he has to give them an opportunity for salvation. And it's no longer the kingdom gospel. That's gone. So what does he say? You got it? Second Peter 3. Verse 15, and if anybody ever questions you about putting too much emphasis on the Apostle Paul, you take them right over here. This is as much as we need. Verse 15, account, understand that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. That's the primary reason for this book is to bring lost people to a knowledge of salvation. God's not willing that any should perish. All right, now read on. Even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Now I've got to stop a minute. What do you suppose is the wisdom that Peter is referring to? Well, the revelation of the mystery. See? They didn't know what it was. In the Jerusalem Council, if we had more time, we could go on back into Galatians chapter 2 and pursue that Jerusalem Council a little further where Peter, James, and John were confronted by Paul and Barnabas. And the language is such that the twelve did not have the wisdom of understanding that Paul has now received because of this revelation of the mystery. All right, And that's what he's referring to. He says to his fellow Jews, look, if you want salvation, you go to Paul's epistles. Read on. Because of the wisdom given unto him, he has written unto you, as also in all his epistles, Romans through Philemon, as well as Hebrews, speaking in them of these things, how to be saved, in which are some things hard to be understood. Why? Well, Peter's a law-keeping Jew. And then to be confronted with this grace message, it's faith plus nothing. Wow, can't handle that. You've got to keep the law. You've got to practice circumcision. You've got to do that. That was Peter's thinking. And see, that's where he and Paul had that falling out. But now, at the end of his life, the Holy Spirit is inspiring him to set the record that, look, Paul's epistles is speaking in them of these things, even though in them, those epistles there are things hard to be understood, which they who are unlearned and unstable twist. Now, here is the kicker. This is what guarantees you and I that Paul's epistles are just as much Scripture as any other book in your Bible. It's all just as official or as just as believable. Here it is. Those who are unlearned and unstable twist as they do also the, what's the next word? Other Scriptures. Now, you see, you've got to watch words. Now, what does that mean? Paul's epistles are on the same official level as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and all the rest, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Revelation. They are all 
Scripture. Don't ever let anybody tell you that you don't have to pay attention to what Paul says. Paul is the Word of God directed to the Gentile people of this age of grace. All right, let's see. I'm looking at a few more uh, mysteries yet. Ephesians chapter 3, I think I missed one. Come back there a moment. Ephesians chapter 3. Yeah, verse 5. Which in other ages, way back all the way to Adam, this revelation of the mystery was not made known to the sons of men and is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. Now you've got to remember, so far as Paul was concerned, the only apostles and prophets that now had validity were those who came from his own ministry. Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and Titus, those were the men to whom Paul had now delegated his message. All right, then you come on down to... Verse 8 and 9, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach amongst the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, that body of truth, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, well, as long as it hid in God, who could get at it? Nobody. So it was totally kept secret in the mind of God until he revealed it to this apostle. All right? So it's been hid in God. All right, now let's see. Let's go on over to Colossians. We looked at it a moment ago. Let's look at it again. Verse 26. The mystery. Colossians 1. The mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest or has been revealed to the saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the indwelling Holy Spirit. That was an unknown. Now, I just made a series of four programs last Wednesday, just before we left coming out here. And uh, I made it on the Theophanies, how that God came down in Old Testament days, took on human form temporarily to accomplish something, and then went back on up into the glory. Well, Throughout those, those programs, I was trying to constantly emphasize the fact that God was revealing himself to mankind in, in times past in a different way than he does today. But whatever, we have to realize that when he unveiled these mysteries and it became that body of truth that is all sufficient for our own salvation as well as for our behavior in our daily life. Uh, Christ in you. Oh, let's see. What else did I have? Oh, I know what I was going to say. In the Old Testament time, the Holy Spirit did not indwell like he does today. He came upon them. And I guess the best example was old Samson. See, when the Holy Spirit was upon Samson, he could do feats of a million men, you might say, because it was a supernatural. But if the Holy Spirit left him, he was no stronger than any other man. And so that's the way the Holy Spirit operated in the Old Testament economy. He would come up on somebody for whatever purposes God had, and he would leave. Well, see, you and I don't have to worry about that. He is never going to leave us. The Holy Spirit is indwelling us. He's within us, and he will never leave us nor forsake us. Well, Maybe I've made my point. Now then, let's go back for the few moments we have left and uh, stop at 1 Corinthians 15 once again, but now go up to 1 through 4. I know you've been waiting all afternoon for me to hit these, <clears throat> but we got there. And this is Paul's gospel. This is Paul's gospel. Don't you ever think of 
anything else when you speak of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And again, what's the circumstances? He's writing to a Gentile church in Corinth, Greece. Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles. And watch it carefully what he says. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. What does that mean? Is there another one? No, it's the one and only, see? I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand positionally now because of his teaching, by which you are saved. Now this is so beautiful. This is so simplistic. Can you tell me why nobody ever uses it? I said nobody, almost nobody. I checked tract after tract that comes into the ministry. Hardly anybody uses these four verses. I've watched church bulletins wherever we go. And if they happen to have on the back of the bulletin, how to be saved, I go back down through the, they don't use this. They use John 3.16 and various other, but they do not use this, and I can't understand why. Because this is as simple as you can get it. That if you believe, see? Now verse 3. Or verse 2 finishing, I'm sorry. By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory. In other words, you understand what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Now here's Paul's gospel. 4. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Where? I think on the desert, those three years. When the Lord laid all this out to him, and took away all his legalism, see? And this is where it's at, Paul. Tell the world that this is how they can be saved. How that Christ died for our sins according to Scriptures. He was buried. And how he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. Simple as ABC. The Creator God himself, took on human flesh, died the death of the cross, shed his blood, was buried three days and three nights, rose victoriously from death and the grave, and now has pronounced that if we believe that, we're his for all eternity. Now that's as simple as anything can get. But oh, like I said this morning, they've got to put something on it. They've got to add to it. They've got to smirch it. And uh, what a travesty. What a pity, see? But that's Paul's gospel. All right, now then, it's that gospel plus nothing for salvation. Now, granted, as I've always tried to express, when people experience this gospel, their life is going to be changed. They're going to have spiritual interest. They're going to testify. They're going to witness to people. They're going to, they're going to have a lifestyle that others can see what a change they are. I'll go back again to my men in Oklahoma. Man, a couple of them were the worst in the two-county area. I had the funeral for one of them. He was a World War II paratrooper. Tremendous guy. A character if ever was one, back in the mountains of Oklahoma. But I had his funeral. And after the funeral, those old men would come up and tell me, Les, do you know what a drunk he was? No, I didn't know that. Nobody got drunker than he did. His own brother got hit right between the eyes in a barroom gunfight. That was his background. And listen, after he got saved, he became the best testimony in that part of Oklahoma. My, I heard him pray one time at a table meal. There isn't a preacher in 10 states that could preach a sermon in 20 minutes like he prayed in three or four. Just unbelievable. Why? God took a hold of him. Fabulous testimony. His daughter... She and her husband were in the oil boom business in the 80s and got filthy wealthy. And because of it, of course, they, they lost their, their marriage and everything like that. 
But anyhow, she was living pretty much on the wild side, and I had never met her personally. But uh, after her dad got saved and had this change of life, she had to have some real serious neck surgery, and so O.J. went up and sat at her bedside until she was able to get along without constant care. So anyway, as time went by, she got involved with the ministry, and in fact, she's the one who bought our first big blackboard for the TV show. And so when she was showing her interest in spirit, I just couldn't help but ask, I said, Nancy, when did you get such a change of life? She said, no less. Do you remember when Daddy came up and sat by me in the hospital a couple years ago? And I said, yeah. She said, that wasn't the Daddy I grew up with. See that? That wasn't the Daddy I grew up with. And it made a difference in his daughter's life. Well, see, this is the whole idea now then, that when salvation becomes a reality, it's going to change everything. It's going to change your outlook. It's going to change how, the, uh, how you work in business. It's going to make a difference. But for salvation, so that you can leave here in a little bit and know that if you get in a car wreck and you're slipped out into eternity, you can know that you're safe for eternity. You don't have to worry because this is the promise. All right, here's one of them. Romans 1, 16. We're going to do this fairly quickly. Romans 1, 16. And remember what I'm looking for. Faith plus nothing. And what's faith? Taking God at his word. God said it, you believe it, and he accepts it. All right, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, that's why I took you to 1 Corinthians 15. What's the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth and is baptized and is memorized and is and is and is. Is that what it says? To everyone that what? Believeth. Period. Plus nothing. You see that? Chapter 3. Oh, whenever I get into Romans chapter 3, I've got to start at verse 19. Can't help it. Just have to. Verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law, the Ten Commandments, that whatever the Ten Commandments saith, it saith to them who are under the law, which was Israel. But it didn't stop with Israel, that every mouth may be stopped. That is, the whole human race comes under the power of the Ten Commandments, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world, not just Israel, and that all the world may become guilty before God, Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Why? For by the law, the Ten Commandments, is not the knowledge of salvation. It's the knowledge of what? Sin. That's all the law can do is condemn. It can't save anybody. You know, I had a phone call here oh, a few months ago now. I shared it with one of my seminars, I think up in Wisconsin. And the young man was all upset with me. He was downright angry. He said, Les, he said, I watch you. He said, I love your program. But he said, this morning or whatever it was, he said, you made me mad. I said, well, what's the problem? He said, I didn't like what you said about the Ten Commandments. I said, well, what did I say about the Ten Commandments? He said, you said that they were a ministration of death. I didn't say that. I said, the book did. Now i got to show you. Keep your hand in Romans, 2 Corinthians, chapter 3. Verse 5 and 6. 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, start verse 5. All 
Y'all got it? Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Now, that's why I had to use chapter, uh, verse 5. God. Who? Now, here's where grammar comes in. Who is who talking about? God in verse 5. So God also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter. Now, when Paul says the letter in this case, he's talking about the Ten Commandments. We are of the New Testament, not of the Ten Commandments or the law. We're of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. For the letter, the law, killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, are you seeing that? But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stone, what for goodness sakes was engraven in stone? The Ten Commandments. And what is it called? A ministration of death. And he didn't like that. I said, well, that's what the book said. I don't care. It made me mad. I said, why? Because he says, I'm going to go to heaven keeping those Ten Commandments. And I said, young man, let me ask you one question. Are you a practicing Roman Catholic? Yes. And I said, you honestly think you're going to get to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments? He's absolutely. I said, look, I said, my Bible tells us that no man can keep God's law. Only Christ Jesus did it. He said, I don't care. He said, I may not be able to keep them all all the time, but he said, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> so anyway, I didn't say much more, and he wound it up. And he said, well, Les, he said, I know you love God. I know you love his word, but he says, I'm afraid I'll never see you in heaven. And I, I know you won't. End of conversation. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny, but it's sad because he's legion. Now, I usually have beauty operators that are the ones that express it the most while women in her beauty shop and if spiritual things come up, even in the Bible Belt of Oklahoma. The majority of women in their conversation express the fact that they're keeping the Ten Commandments. That's their idea of going to heaven. Well, isn't that sad? They're going to work, 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 and all for nothing. Well, anyway, where was I? First, uh, Romans chapter 3. So always remember that, that the law is nothing but a ministration of death. It condemns us because we're all lawbreakers, see? All right, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Not the knowledge of salvation. It's the knowledge of sin. It tells me I'm a sinner. It tells you you're a sinner. Iris and I had first-hand experience. Maybe you've heard me refer to it because several years ago we had a seminar out in Denver and after the seminar we went out with our host and hostess to her home for dinner and while we were having dinner uh, their nephew and her wife, his wife, sorry, their nephew and his wife came in just to visit. And so they sat down as we were at the dinner table. And she was a lovely little 33-year-old young mother. And these things came up. And uh, she said, well, I have always been a Christian. Always? Yeah. She said, I've never done anything wrong. I was a good girl growing up. I never did anything immoral. I'm a good wife. I'm a good mother. And uh, so she said, yeah, I've always been a Christian. I said, you've never realized that you were lost? No, I've never been lost. I said, well, Lisa, you can't be saved until you know you're lost. But anyway, this started at 7 in the evening, and it was 10 o'clock before we finally convinced her with the Scriptures that the law condemned her. You're a sinner until you're saved, see? Okay, 
And so here's what people have to understand, that the law cannot save anybody, can't even help you. All it can do is condemn us because we're lawbreakers. See? All right, now go on. Verse 21. But now, on this side of the cross, <coughs> in the age of grace, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, everything builds together. See, that's why I say you don't throw anything of Scripture away. It's all part of the revelation of God's program for mankind, leading up to this glorious revelation of the mysteries. All right, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. In other words, when we become a believer, God imputes his righteousness on our behalf. God doesn't look at Les Feldick. God looks at the righteousness of God. And the same way with you. God doesn't look at you, the person. He sees Jesus Christ. All right. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe and are baptized. See? It doesn't say that doesn't say that, or anything else. It's believe plus how much? Nothing. Believe it. Don't look for something else to do. Okay, come on up a little further in the same chapter. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption, the process of paying the price, paying the debt for my sin with his blood through that redemption that is in Christ Jesus who has set forth whom has God has set forth be a propitiation through faith in his blood the atoning blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past total forgiveness through the forbearance of God now look at verse 26 to declare i say at this time his righteousness that he, see where all the emphasis is going? Back to God up in verse 25. That he might be just and be the justifier, the one who claims there is nothing left against us. We are forgiven. Our sin debt is paid. He is declaring us just as if we've never sinned. When? When you believe. You see that? To that person who believeth. Plus nothing. Plus nothing. See, this is the point I'm making. You with me? Now, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. I hope you're having as much fun as I am. I'm sick, but I'm having fun. <clears throat> Look at this. Therefore, being justified by faith, plus, huh? No, nothing. Therefore, being justified by faith, plus nothing. What do we have? Peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, until we're saved, do we have peace with God? No way, we're an enemy. We're under constant conviction. But once we enter into that glorious salvation, we have peace with God. I don't have to sweat and worry and wonder, have I done enough? Have I refrained enough? No, I have peace with God. He's taking care of it, see? And we trust it, we believe it. And then verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. You don't have to be sweating out, what do I have to do next? How much do I have to give? See, now that's another question that comes in every day. Less, do I have to give 10%? No, you don't have to give 10%. That was law. Now, that's a guideline. It's certainly nice if you can afford 10% without crimping on paying your bills. But see, what comes in so often, people get hit with a devastating illness and they're just overrun with bills and bills and bills. 
And then these preachers still come down, that's all right, but you give me your 10% first. And I say, no, you don't. You do not give one penny that God knows you can't afford to give. And you give as you feel God wants you to give. Whether it's 1% or if it's none for a while, that's your freedom. We're under grace. Now, if you get to the place where you can give 50%, hey, praise the Lord. I'll never forget years ago when I was a kid, old Laterno, you know, the guy that had the road building equipment? He came along, you know, bragging that he could give 90% of his income to the Lord. Well, so what? He was making $50 million a year, so what that leave him? <laughs> that don't impress me a bit. But you see, Paul now makes the statement in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, let every man give as God lays it on your heart. Not grudgingly, gosh, I don't want to give today, but I have to. No, God doesn't want that. He wants a cheerful giver. You know, I got a pastor down in uh, Florida, Baptist Church, and uh, I'd been down there three, four, five years in a row and always had all three services on Sunday, and he never gave any indication that he disagreed with me on anything. But about the fourth year, we were having dinner after church, and he said, you know, Les, there's just one area of all your teaching that I can't agree with. I said, what's that? He said, I have to preach the 10% tithe. I said, why? Well, he said, I just have to. He said, it, it's, it's what the Bible declared. Let every man give, uh, or the uh, Malachi, you know, you're robbing God and all. I said, well, Pastor Ken, I said, uh, someday God will open your eyes. I said, I, I don't want to differ with you, but anyway. Well, this was in March. I got down there the next February, and he got ready to introduce me, and he says, now, you know, my church people know this has happened, but for you, visitor, I've got to tell you something. He said, I could never agree with less on giving. I had to preach that 10% tithe, and he was always claiming you give as the Lord lays it on your heart. He said, last October, he said, I could not sleep because of one word in that verse, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, and it's the word, not of necessity. Don't give because you feel you have to. And finally, he said, I said, okay, Lord, okay, you've convinced me. I'll try it. So he said, I announced to the church on the first Sunday in October, somewhere back there, that we are now going to preach you give as God lays it on your heart, not because you have to. And he says, here we are six months later. And he says, thanks to that old farmer, he said, our giving tripled. <laughs> tripled. When you take them off of that 10% tithe. And I know it works because it's the biblical way of doing it in this dispensation of grace. You are not under that Malachi tithe. Now, that should set some of you free. <laughs> but anyway, all of these things are part of this freedom of grace in this dispensation of grace, the revelation of these mysteries. All right, let's move on. Oh, let's see. Let's go to chapter 7. A couple of verses in here that I always like to bring out when we're doing something like this. Romans chapter 7. Drop in at verse 4. Romans 7, verse 4. <coughs> Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. In other words, by his work of the cross. That you should be married or brought into a union with another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Just like a man and woman comes together in marriage for the primary God-given purpose of propagating the race, to bring forth children. All right, believers ought to do the same thing in the spiritual realm. We should be able to bring forth those that we've won to Christ out of their lostness. 
Now, verse 5, for when we were in the flesh, before we were saved, the motions or the acts of sins which were by the law, they did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. In other words, it will come up at the great white throne judgment for eternal doom. Now verse 6, but now, on this side of the cross, in this age of grace, now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve or live in newness of spirit, the Holy Spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter or the law. And so all the way through his letters, he's constantly making reference to this fact that we are set free from the demands of the law and that we are now safe by faith plus nothing. Now come over to chapter 8. Verse 1 is one of my favorite verses of Scripture. Romans 8, verse 1. Most of you should know it from memory. There is therefore now no condemnation. You hear that? There is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. You're there by virtue of your believing the gospel. And then verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And how do we enter into it? By faith plus nothing. Okay, let's come on over to chapter 10, still in Romans. <clears throat> Verse 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Now that's not a work, that's just simply saying what God has done for you. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart plus anything? No. That if you believe with all your heart that God has raised him from the dead, what is that? Paul's gospel. And what's the promise? You'll be saved. That's it. Then you're saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Absolutely. My goodness, I tell people I deal with constantly. Just like I did that, that Buddhist out in Washington. Man, you don't have to pray the sinner's prayer. Now that may throw a curve at you. What was the sinner's prayer? God be merciful to me, a sinner. Is that still appropriate? No. No. Why? God has already showed his mercy. It was his mercy that took him to the cross. Why ask him to do it over again? So at salvation, you don't beg for mercy. You thank God he's already given it to you. And you believe it. And you trust it. See? Oh, it just gets simpler and simpler. That by God's mercy and by simply believing, it is imputed unto to us. So, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with his mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him, plus nothing, shall not be ashamed. Well, let's see. Let's go over to, oh, I just can't pass over Corinthians. I just have to use this one. 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. So that you come behind in no gift. In other words, those carnal Corinthian believers still had all of God's grace. They were capitalizing on everything that the apostle was teaching them. And they were waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like I told you earlier, Paul honestly thought that the rapture would take place before his life ended. He evidently thought the body of Christ wasn't going to be all that big. But now look at verse 8. My, what a promise. Who shall also confirm you 
absolutely make it sure. He shall confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless. Now I got to think of a, remind you of a thing that took place. I hadn't been in Oklahoma very long, less than a year. And somebody told me of a couple just down the street from the church where they were members, where the gentleman was laid out hopelessly with a stroke. He was conscious, but he had no ability to move whatsoever. And his poor wife, they didn't have many uh, funds to go on. His poor wife was taking care of him. And so somebody said, Les, I don't think there is a preacher in town that ever stops by to see that couple. If you ever find time, just stop in. So I had cattle north of that town, and so I uh, stopped in one morning on my way out to feed cattle and went over and visited with them a little bit, prayed with the old fellow. And she walked me to the front door, stepped outside on, on a stoop, and she said, Les, has this happened to us because one or the other of us has sin on our back? That's the way she put it. And I said, well, tell me. Are you believers? Yes. You know you're saved? Yes. Then how in the world can God hold a sin against you? I said, he can't. Your sins are forgiven. They're gone. Buried where? In the deepest sea. Well, she said, I guess I've never thought of it that way before. But see, isn't it sad how people will go through and miss all the glory of this grace salvation, not realizing that when God forgave us, he forgave everything, past, present, future. They were all forgiven. They are all buried. And God will never bring one of them up. That's what this verse says, see? He will confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I just shared this with a class in Oklahoma the other night. What's the day of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it's the rapture. Now, I'm going to really shake you up. What if? Hopefully, it won't happen, but it can. What if a Christian man and a Christian woman commit adultery, and five minutes after the act, the trumpet sounds. Now what? They haven't had time to get right with the Lord. Are they going to come before the Lord now with that guilt of adultery on them? But what does this verse tell you? No. They're going to be blameless. Now see, we can't comprehend that in the human realm. And that's not license. That's not saying, hey, go out and commit adultery. God is not going to hold again. That's not the idea. But if it should happen that a believer falls and the Lord should come in the next minute, it's not going to be held against him. Now, what power am I alluding to? The power of the blood of Christ. You and I have not got a clue of what power of atonement was in the blood of Christ. It washes men's sin from stem to stern. And we hear so little of it. We hear so little of it. But listen, that was the whole idea. Now, let me stretch your imagination. Do you remember the day of atonement back in Israel's history? On the day of atonement, the high priest would bring out three animals. And he would kill the first one, take the blood, trek all the way in behind the veil, went into the Holy of Holies, sprinkled a few drops of blood on the mercy seat for whose sin? For his own. He'd go back and he'd kill the second animal. Same thing. Take some of the blood, take it all the way in, sprinkle a few drops on the mercy seat. How much of Israel's sin did that take care of and for how long? All their sin for one whole year. That was the whole idea of the Day of Atonement. And that was animal blood. But you see, when the blood of Christ was shed and he, as I've 
taught it over and over, took that blood of Calvary into the Holy of Holies in heaven, and as his role as the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and he presented that atoning blood in the mercy seat in heaven, it didn't just cover our sin for one year, but for how long? Forever. Now that's the blood of Christ, beloved. That's where you better put your faith, not in some denomination, not in some organization, but put it where it belongs, that the blood of Christ has cleanseth us from all our sin. And that's not license. What believer that can enjoy such forgiveness will go out and take advantage of that? I can't think of one. If you're a true believer, you don't want to put God in that position. You're going to do everything in your power to keep from falling. And God's going to do everything in his power to keep you from falling. So I don't have to apologize and say, oh, well, people are going to say, you know, in fact, Paul does the same thing. Come back with me. Oh, he had the same problem. Oh, let's see. Is it in Romans 3 again? Yeah. Come back to Romans chapter 3. Paul had the same problem. He was so exuberant about the forgiveness and the grace of God that people thought that he was just telling them, well, go out and sin like the devil and the grace of God will cover you. No, that's not the idea. Romans 3, verse 7 and 8, For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner, and not rather, now watch, in parenthesis, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, and what were they accusing Paul of saying? Let us do evil that good may come. Go out and sin like you feel like it and test the grace of God. No, Paul says, I don't say something like that. That's slander. Well, that's the way I feel with my teaching. The grace of God is so fantastic. The blood of Christ is so powerful that we don't have to shake in our boots for fear that we've got an unconfessed sin. We're cleansed, past, present, future, and the Holy Spirit is constantly leading us not to take advantage of that glorious grace. Well, let's see, where was it? 1 Corinthians 1. I just didn't want to pass the next part, which is even better than what we just saw. And that is, come down to verse 18 through 24. Tremendous set of verses. For the preaching of the cross, Paul's gospel is to them that perish foolishness. In other words, the world out there thinks we're nuts. Come together on a beautiful Sunday, uh, Saturday afternoon to study God's word. Man, there's something wrong with you, you know. They think this is foolishness. But unto us who are saved, who know this great saving grace, it's the what? It's the power of God. Boy, now I know, I've come a long ways in the last 20 years. But you know what I've learned? God is interested in the little things, the little details, things that you would think are completely silly. But God provides the little things, let alone the big ones. All right, so this is it. It's the power of God, even in the little things. Now let's move on. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? That is, all the philosophers and the intellectuals. Now verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. What does that mean? Well, the great philosophers haven't a clue of the things of God. They can't comprehend one verse of this book. It's beyond them. All right. 
But it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe plus uh-oh, we ran out of gas, didn't we? <laughs> Are you seeing it, Michelle? <laughs> yeah? She's the one that asked me. Faith plus nothing? Faith plus nothing? It's all faith plus nothing. See? All right. So to them that believe, for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks, the Gentiles, seek after wisdom. Now what's Paul saying? Israel was always saying, well, show me a sign. Show me a miracle. Show me sign, wonders, and miracles. Then maybe I can buy it. But on the other hand, the Greeks, as we saw Paul confronted on Mars Hill, looked down at that insignificant preacher of resurrection as some kind of a nimwit because they were the degreed intellectuals. They were the great authors and mathematicians, the Archimedes, and so forth. But you know, I always remind my listeners, when Iris and I, if any of you have been with us, and we go to Mars Hill, there's a big brass plaque. And who do you suppose it's in memorial of? Not any of the big Greek philosophers. Not a Homer. Not an Archimedes. Not any of the other great ones the Apostle Paul. And you remember the account in Acts? What did those great intellectuals call Paul? The babbler. Remember that? Well, let's just see what this babbler has to say. Oh, listen. That's the way the world is today. They think we're just a bunch of numbskulls for believing all this stuff. Like I referred to this morning, these Jesus seminar people, with their degrees, and they come out with the most idiotic stuff, and they ridicule our faith and what we call precious just because of all their education. Now, i got nothing against education. Don't get me wrong. But when they use that as pomp and circumstance, then I've got no time for them. I can't help it because they are barking up the wrong tree. All right, here it is. The Jews require a sign the Greeks seek after wisdom, degrees, intellectuals. But here's our side of the coin. Paul says, we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness. And now here it is. But unto them who are called, you and I as believers, whether we be Jew or Greek, it's Christ, the power of God. Now that's what Israel was looking for in signs and wonders. They wanted miraculous power. Hey, we've got it. And we don't have to have miracles, signs and wonders and so forth. We've got it. It's right here between two covers and the indwelling spirit. And on top of that, we've got the other side of the coin. We also have what? We've got the wisdom. We've got it both by simple faith. Isn't that amazing? We got them both. Don't forget that. Well, about time to wind it up. All right, verse 25. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. All right, I got one or two more in Ephesians, and then we're going to close. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1, and you, Paul writing to believers, as always, and you he hath quickened or made alive spiritually, you who were, past tense, dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our manner of living in times past in lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, but God. There was one I used in the But God series. Remember it? 
but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, he hath quickened us, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved, plus nothing. He hath raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeded riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now here it is. For by grace. By God's unmerited favor. We don't deserve it, beloved. But it's by grace that we're saved through faith. Taking God at his word. And not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And you do not work for a gift. All right, now then. Here we move beyond the faith plus nothing. As salvation begins to work out in our everyday life, it's not of works lest any man should boast for salvation, but we are his workmanship. We are now a new created creature in Christ Jesus. For what purpose? To do good works. To let, to let, our, let our impact be felt in the community. Let your impact be felt at the voting box. Now, I don't get into politics, but I'll tell you what. We believers better put feet to our votes because we're under satanic attack like never before. I'm not going to tell you how to vote. I just say vote. And if you're a true child of God, you'll know how to vote. I can leave it at that, can't I? <clears throat> Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. All right, now I got a minute for a couple of three more good verses. Wherefore, remember that you, being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, in other words, while God was dealing with Israel back there in the Old Testament day, you were Gentiles in the flesh who, the uns, who were called uncircumcision by the Jew. But now look at verse 12. This is what our Gentile ancestors were up against. That at that time, you Gentiles, were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Have you ever wondered what was the lot of the non-Jewish world? There it was. They had no hope. They had no salvation. They had no one ministering to them. God never told Israel to go evangelize the Gentile. Here they were, without hope. Without God in this world, doomed. But oh, look at the next verse. But now, but now, on this side of the cross, in Christ Jesus, you who are at one time far off have been made nigh unto God by what? The blood of the cross. Can you praise the Lord for it? Oh, just praise him and praise him and praise him because it's such a glorious, glorious salvation. And this is nothing. My goodness. And you know, the Bible doesn't tell us much about eternity. You know, my, my daughter was a horse lover. Most of you know her. She's loved horses since she was three years old. And even before she got hurt, we were talking about these things. And she said, Daddy, you suppose one day... God will give me a horse barn a half mile long. <laughs> I mean, that's how much she loves horses. But uh, we don't know. We just don't know. Are we going to live in homes? Are we going to eat three meals a day? <laughs> I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. All I tell everybody when they call, well, what's eternity going to be like? I've just got one word for it. Glorious. Glorious. 